Welcome to the world according to Boyer, where we bring top investors, best-selling authors, and business leaders to show you the smartest ways to uncover value in the stock market. I'm your host, Jonathan Boyer. Today's guest is Leon Cooperman, one of the most successful money managers in history. If I went through his full professional biography, we would run out of time, so I will just go through the highlights. Leon started his investment career at Goldman Sachs, where he eventually became chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Prior to that, he ran the firm's research department, and for nine consecutive years, he was voted the number one portfolio strategist in Institutional Investor Magazine. At the end of 1991, Leon retired from Goldman to start his own investment management business, Omega Advisors, which he ran for 27 years before converting it to a family office. At its height, Omega managed more than $10 billion of client funds. Mr. Cooperman and his family are extremely philanthropic. He and his wife, Toby, are signers of the Giving Pledge and have generously made substantial gifts to both Columbia, where Leon received his MBA, and Hunter College, where he obtained his undergraduate degree. The Coopermans also made the largest donation in St. Barnabas Medical Center history, as well as other major donations to help those less fortunate. Leon, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm getting so damn old, I'm dealing with the children of people I knew many years ago. <laughs> but they were dead for me. Yeah, no, I was speaking to my father, Mark, and he rem- remember being the same stock US shoe with you years and years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said it was run by the worst CEO uh, he ever met. The highest ratio of tile to brains. <laughs> In 2018, you converted to a family office. And one of the reasons you cited was you did not want to spend the rest of your life trying to chase the S&P 500. Now that you're just managing your own money, you know, has your investment process or strategy evolved at all? Well, let me give you a little bit longer answer preceding it. Everybody, myself included, was shocked that I retired. I love the business. I live by the motto, do what you love, love what you do. It's not work. It's just something you just enjoy doing. I feel very much like if you saw a Godfather 2, I've only seen it 50 times, there's a scene at the airport where Hyman Roth gets shot. And right before they shoot him, he says, I'm a retired executive living on a pension. I'm a retired money manager living on investment income. The bad news is I have no active income, meaning I have no income from wages or salaries or from clients. The good news is I live on dividends and interest income and capital gains and losses. That's the bad news. The good news is I have no pressure. So I think at age 78, it was a good swap to go from income oriented to absence of pressure, particularly in my case, since my, you mentioned it very kindly, my wife and I have committed, we told Warren Buffett this nine years ago, uh, asking for half isn't asking for enough. We intend to give away all our money. And so I was working 70 hour work weeks for charity, many people I didn't know. And so I'm happy with my decision. How has my life changed? I told everybody who asked me when I announced my retirement that my change would be as follows. I'm gonna sleep an hour later in the morning. When I was in business, I got up at 5.10, got in the office at 6.45. I'm gonna to go to the gym three times a week to deal with my weight issue, which I've carried all my life. And both of those I've done very religiously. And the third thing I'm gonna do I have not done and that was I was going to learn how to bid in bridge. I have very good card sense and how to play a hand well, but I don't know the bidding conventions. I've been so damn busy in retirement that I've not had the chance to take any bridge lessons. You hit on one other thing. I'm going to be more long-term oriented, be tax efficient. The great Warren Buffett, I guess almost 40 years ago in one of his annual reports, went through a hypothetical example of every year, you bought that year's hot stock, you made 15%, sold it, paid your taxes, and reinvested what was left. The next year's hot stock made 15%, as opposed to a 15% cereal grower. At the end of 40 years, you had thousands of times more money left in the long-term investment approach than the trading approach. Now, of course, it was a hyperbole example because if you're trading, you hope to get more than 15% when you go into that year's hot stock. But I am more long-term oriented, more tax conscious, and also because I'm very heavily weighed in common stocks, Because I think the market is fully valued and more likely to fall than go up a lot, I'm putting more money into non-equity deals, private deals, real estate, and other kind of deals where I know the people or have confidence in the people. That raises an interesting question. Obviously, your circumstance is very different than most. The traditional rule has always been 
60-40. This is a very vague rule. Equities, the bonds. With interest rates where they are in the market, not just- I think virtually no bonds. I think bonds offer return-free risk. Return-free risk. Basically, if you take the 1.45 treasury, you tax affect it, then the people that are buying treasuries that are taxable probably have a 40% tax rate. So you keep 60 of the 1.4, which is 84 basis points, and the inflation rate is running 2% or more, basically you have a negative return on your capital. And there are many stocks you could buy that have dividend yields higher than the treasury yield and are growing. So as much as I'm not overly enthusiastic about equities as a class, I would say that they clearly are superior to fixed income. And I own very little fixed income. So if you were back as your role as a portfolio strategist at Goldman, what would you be advising clients? Well, I would say minimal exposure to bonds. Everybody has their own. If I'm dealing with wealthy people, I tell them, you're already wealthy. Do what makes you comfortable. If you're not comfortable, don't do it. So I'm comfortable having no fixed income. So I have stocks and cash. Stocks are infinitely better than bonds. And I don't expect a lot from the stock market. Even the, the non-FANG type of names, are there value in the smaller type of stocks? Yeah, I would say that I've said this before. I'll repeat it again. We're really dealing with three stock markets. The first market, which is very well known and discovered, is the FANG market. And that's the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Microsofts of the world. And against a 1.4% bond rate, they're not expensive. Went back, if you give me a second, I went back and looked at the Nifty 50 of 1972. And in 1972, JP Morgan U.S. True Trust ruled the roost. They had a philosophy, only the right stock at any price. They were impervious to what they paid as long as they bought a world-class growth company. So in 72, they paid 65 times for Avon, 25 times for Dow, 48 times for Kodak, gone, 26 times for GE, 37 times for IBM, 34 times for Kmart, gone, 90 times for Polaroid, gone, 30 times for Revlon, almost gone, 31 times for Sears Roebuck, gone, 34 times for Kresge, gone, 41 times for Xerox. In 1972, those valuations were alongside a 10-year government of 6.5%. So the 10-year government at 145, it's hard to come up with the conclusion that anything's overvalued. But I believe that the 10-year government is overvalued. So I don't believe in using an overvalued instrument to discount a stream of earnings. So that's the first market. And as long as we avoid a recession and interest rates go up very gradually and modestly, the FANG stocks are okay. And I, in fact, in the family office, even though I'm a value investor, my biggest position is Google. I have a 4% position in Microsoft. I have 6% in Google. I got a little bit of Facebook. I got a 2% position in Amazon. You know, that's one market. Expensive, but not ridiculously so. The second market, which is ridiculous, is the Robinhood market. And that's a bunch of 30-year-olds that are getting checks in the government that are trading in an environment of zero interest rates, zero commissions. And they're playing the game. I guess they can't go to sporting events. And so they're playing the stock market. And I think that's going to end in tears. I've said that previously. And unfortunately... The first time I said that on television was on CNBC, the very next day, somebody committed suicide who lost a lot of money in Robin Hood. And that's a very sad outcome. You know, you look at things, a Carl Icahn is about as smart as they come. He sells his mistake and hurts at 72 cents a share. And two weeks later, the Robin Hood crowd is trading at five. GME, I don't know Abe Plotkin, but I'm sure he's a very smart guy. We got squeezed here, but you know, for... GME to go from two to 500, we had a $50 billion market cap as irrational. And the whole market trades in a very crazy way. And I think that when it goes down, and it will go down one day, it's going to go down as fast as it went up. And the third market is the market that I track in, that Boyer Research tracks in, and that's the value market. And there are plenty of things you can find to do there. I'm reasonably fully invested, no bonds of any consequence. And I recognize what's been going on the last several years is everybody has been pushed out on the risk curve. The person that bought T-bills 10 years ago said, I can't survive in zero. I'll take duration and inflation risk, not buy T-bonds. The T-bond buyer says, I can't get by on one to one and a half. I'll buy industrial bonds. The industrial bond buyer says, I can't get by on two or 3%. I'll buy high yield. The high yield buyer says, I can't get by on four or 5%. Of our structured credit, which is an opaque market, has a higher yield. 
and the structured credit guy says, well, the stock market's hot as can be. I'm going to take 25% of my fixed income fund. I'm going to put in equities. And the equity guy is putting 2% in Bitcoin. And that's what's happening. Everybody's moving in the risk curve. And it's very clear what's going on. I understand it. I'm not saying it's wrong, but you should appreciate it. The only thing that's wrong is Mr. Powell, the head of the Fed, doesn't acknowledge what's going on. And what's going on is very simple. Before the COVID virus hit, there were 5.7 million unemployed people in the country. At the peak in March or February, it got up to 23 million. April, I should say. April, 23 million. It's now down to a little bit over 10 million. We are conducting fiscal and monetary policy with the aim of getting the unemployed back down to 5 million. So just look at what's going on. If you spoke to 100 economists today, okay, they all would agree the potential for real growth in the U.S. economy is about 2% cluster around 2%. How they get there? They say real growth is a function of productivity growth and labor force growth. Productivity grows about 1.5% trend. Labor force growth grows about half of 1%. So the potential for the economy to grow in real terms is about 2%. Real. The economy is growing 6% real based upon the forecast, yet we have interest rates near zero. That doesn't make you're growing three times trend, yet the Fed is keeping interest rates pinned as low as they can possibly be. And on the fiscal side, We've injected a trillion dollars more in stimulus into the economy than has been lost in wages. So we got the pedal to the metal, whatever you want to say. And I think that one day someone's going to wake up and look at all the debt that's being created. This nation was founded 245 years ago. We had no national debt. I think we had in 2019, 21 trillion in debt. Then we have three or four trillion this past year. And it's going to go up another two, three trillion this year. And that's a pace of growth in debt, far in excess of the growth in the economy, which means more and more of our income is going to have to be devoted to debt service. It's not going to come about through immaculate conception. Most bear markets have causative factors, and the causative factor will be a recession or possibly a change in Fed policy. And the Fed will change if they lose control of the things and inflation starts to accelerate. But you see tremendous inflation in commodity prices. But that's less relevant because the big cost of business is labor. And once labor starts to go up, then I think you're going to let the genie out of the bottle. But it is what it is. And I would say unequivocally, in my mind, well-selected stocks are the place to be, bonds are the bubble. So when you graduated from Columbia Business School in the 60s, the tenure was around 5% nominal, eventually reached almost 16% in 81, and rates were choppy for a while in the 80s. But the long-term trend is basically on a path to almost zero, which is crazy. There are signs that rates may finally be rising, which makes sense based on what you just said, although people have been saying this for years. However, most equity investors, myself included today, have not invested through a prolonged rising interest rate environment. What do you think the investment implications for equity investors will be if rates start to rise? How does someone navigate that? Well, it's really a function of the magnitude of the rise and the slope of the rise. I'll give you some statistics. From 1960 to 2012, the market multiple was 15 times, okay? Now we're about 23 times, 22 and a half times. In that period, the 10-year government averaged 6.2%, currently 1.4, and the Fed funds rate was 5%, currently near zero. So the stock market is not discounting current interest rates. It's obviously more richly appraised because of the level of rates. But I would say the market could accommodate a rise in rates. I would say 2% gradual rise would not be a problem for the market. And I think the bigger question is what the Fed is doing. Keep in mind, the most important thing I'm going to say in this podcast is inflation over time is a friend of common stocks because the inflation in a company's costs get incorporated in their selling prices which lifts the nominal level of revenues and earnings. It's only when the central bank is trying to curb inflation that does the market get worried, because the market understands curbing inflation is tantamount to curbing growth. But we have Mr. Powell telling you the stocks are not expensive against interest rates. What he doesn't tell you is interest rates are ridiculously low. They make no sense. People are not going to constantly buy bonds with a negative return. They're going to gravitate into higher-risk assets. I also would make the point that there is history for a prolonged period of underperformance of the major averages. I got my MBA, you mentioned Columbia, on January 31st, 1967. I had a six-month-old child who's now 54. I had no money in the bank. 
I was relatively newly married. I owed money to the government because of a national defense student loan that I had outstanding. And I could not afford a vacation. I went to work at Goldman Sachs the very next day, February 1st, 67. The Dow was roughly 1,000. 14 years later, it was 1,000. It only commenced that rise from 1982. I made a lot of money picking stocks. And that's what I think we got to do. I don't expect much from the averages over the next few years, but I think you can make some money picking stocks, but you won't have the tailwind that we've had. You're going to have a headwind of rising rates. And I also would say this, if rates belong where they are, meaning 1.4, 1.3, and the guy has been very, very right, is Van Hoisington in Houston, basically, and he thinks, he thinks rates are going to go lower. But if rates belong at 1%, you don't make double-digit returns in the stock market. You make single-digit returns, which is evidence of what to expect in economic growth. I believe in the capital market line. So Columbia Business School, you said you started work the very next day. My former boss, one of your very good friends, Mario Gavelli, uh, has, has told me the we're same. We're classmates. We're very friendly to this day. He's terrific. I know he's on a podcast with you. Mario is a great guy, a terrific human being, and one of my best friends. He's fantastic. And one of the articles I was reading said you, him, and a guy by the name of Art Sandberg from Pequot Capital, one of the world's largest hedge funds at a time, all carpooled to Columbia together were in the same class. Yeah, unfortunately, Art just passed away at roughly age 80 for a bout with cancer, which he succumbed to. He was also a terrific human being. Yeah, we were lucky. The only lucky ones were Columbia. I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know the total. I know I've given about 40 million to Columbia. Columbia changed the trajectory of my life. If you have some grandparents listening to this podcast, I can tell you the MBA made a big difference. You know, Mary and I have a similar philosophy. We both say we like to hire PhDs, poor, hungry, and driven. I never could have gotten into Goldman Sachs with a BA from Hunter College. It was the MBA I got from Columbia that opened the door. Warren Buffett says the language of business accounting. I learned accounting, operations research, statistics, stuff like that. I made a lot of friendships I kept for the rest of my life. Mario and Art were ter- two terrific human beings. I, I really miss Art. He's terrific. I speak to Mario every week, and he is a great human being. Mario and I used to jostle with each other. When we were in between classes, we would run to the only phone booth at Columbia, and we would be pushing each other, shoving each other, get access to the phone to call our broker. We had the same broker, High Fishman. I forget the name of his firm. The only thing I know about the firm is Buster Crabb used to be a salesman at that firm. He was the old Tarzan guy. And what I love about Mario is the only thing that's changed about him in the last 50 years is the color of his hair. He had a redhead when I went with him at Columbia, and now he's got a full head of gray hair, but he's just a terrific human being. No, he is. He was a fantastic boss, a great teacher. And it's just amazing when you think about it, that that class produced one of the best investors of a generation. Well, we all studied in the Roger Murray, who was a fabulous practitioner. The original publication of the book, Security Analysis, it's 1934, written by Graham and Dodd. And Murray, I think the second or third edition was Graham, Dodd, Cottle, and I, I Murray authored one series, one edition. And it was amazing. You know, in the original Graham and Dodd, they had a two-page spread, about 20 ratios over 10 years. It's a way of looking at a company to study those ratios and the direction. And I did a study contrasting J.P. Stevens and Burlington Industries, two textile companies, both not around any longer, okay? And Roger Murray, in grading my paper, found the transposition in one of maybe 100 ratios that I put into the report. The guy was amazing, true practitioner, but he really honed my interest in the profession. One of the things I'd love to ask you about, and I think it's probably the hardest part of investing, is when to sell shares. I really think it's unbelievably difficult First, when you were running money professionally, yeah, how did you decide to trim a position that increased in value? Well, we did it in a very disciplined fashion. But now that I run my own money and I don't want to pay taxes, I generally take my highly appreciated stocks. I give it to my foundation and then I give it away to charity. As you kindly mentioned, and I'm very focused. I took the giving pledge with Warren Buffett and I intend to give away all my money. When I buy a stock, we identify the upside and the downside. And so when a stock appreciates to my upside objective, I re-examine the thesis. I either raise the objective or I sell. Second reason I sell something is I find another idea. I'm not the Federal Reserve, but I can't print money. 
I find another idea that has a better risk reward profile than the one that I have. And so I'll sell that and move the money into something else. The third reason I sell is because I changed my view of the market and I decided to become more defensive and I want to raise cash. And right now I'm of the mode where I'm looking to sell things on strength because I fully believe I could be dead wrong and that the market will be, and I said this on a day like today where the market's up 2%, but I think the market will be lower a year from today than it is today. That's my modus operandi. So on a specific example, it's not a huge position for us, but at least according to your latest 13F, you own a company called Synopta, which we own as well. It's a stock that's appreciated in the portfolio in a good way. For us, it's gone. Had an absolutely terrible start there. Let me tell you, I'm known for being very candid. I got a call from a very bright guy who decided to close his fund and basically was going to set up an SPV for Synopta. And even though I didn't know the guy, a guy I respected a lot, told me he was a very bright guy. I put in a decent sum of money into his SPV and bought the stock at seven and a quarter. And it went straight to two bucks. I then decided to do some of my own research. I bought a boatload of stock at two and a quarter. It's now I think around 15 or 14. It closed today around $15 and it's still, it's not crazily expensive. So how do you well, evaluate that? It's, it's going to be in that area where everybody wants to go. It's the health foods and oatmeal and oat brand and oat milk. And I'm still there. And I have a pretty decent sized position between what I put in with the fellow that ran the SPV and what I now own directly. It's a big position. But I'm playing a little bit of momentum there. Typically, I own low multiple stocks. Like an example, I have a large position, something called Mr. Cooper, a mortgage finance company. It's gone from five to 30 this year. And guess what? It's going to earn probably seven or eight dollars this year. It's going to earn five next year. They've been buying back a lot of stock. It's not much different than year in book value, even though it's up fivefold. You got to do your own work today. Wall Street is really, I hate to say this because I came out of Wall Street, useless. I have a decent sized position, something called Paramount Resources. Symbol is POU space CN on Bloomberg. For four months, the stock traded two bucks. For four months, all the analysts in Wall Street had a $2 price objective. The stock is now 10 and a half, and everybody's price objective is 11. At two bucks, there was nobody yelling buy, very few that I know of yelling buy. I kept on buying because I felt good about my analysis. I felt the price of oil was going to grow up because I believe in economic theory. Excess returns brings in competition, which kills returns, and inadequate returns dries out competition and capacity which improves returns over time. And the oil industry went from, I don't know, about 12, 13, 14% of the S&P down to a low of 2 or 3%. And they were not going to invest in anything but the highest return projects. And they all resorted now. The model seems to be we're going to pay dividends and not spend a lot in CapEx. Switching gears just a little bit, you probably went down for a different reason. I know you're living in Florida now, back from high tax New Jersey. I came to Florida because I got arthritis all over my body, <laughs> and I wanted a warm climate. I have spinal stenosis in my neck. I got conjugalization in my right knee, a herniated disc problem. But I love the lifestyle down here. And let me be honest, if the tax rate in New Jersey was 4 or 5% and Florida was zero, I would not have bothered becoming a Florida resident. But I love it down here. But when you're talking 11 or 12% versus zero, it's a no-brainer. Andrew Cuomo said people are leaving New York because of the weather. They don't get it. They talk about everybody paying their fair share. And there's a tax and spend model. And New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, California, they're going to lose population because people aren't stupid. And I live in a gated community with lots of security. I enjoy it down here. I ride a bicycle every day. I don't do that in New Jersey. I have entertainment at night. I have a country club I can eat in, I can eat out. But I like the lifestyle, but I did not come down for taxes. It's definitely a plus. And I'm telling you, the real estate down here in my club is on fire. I'll tell you an example. My son and daughter-in-law asked me to take a visit from one of their friends who was looking to buy in St. Andrews Country Club to have a home. So they came down two weeks ago. I gave them my view, which was very positive. They put a bid in the house, bid the guy's asking price, $2.175 million. Three people came in and bid against each other. The house went for $300,000 above the asking price, above the asking price. It's all timing. It's my second home in St. Andrews. My first home I bought 25 years ago. I sold it 25 years later for what I paid for it. 
now things are on fire. I think it has a lot to do with people coming from New York down here. A friend of mine lives in Frenchman's Creek up in Jupiter, and he put his house in the market, sold it one day for his asking price. And the next day, somebody came in at $100,000 over asking, but he already executed a contract. He's a very honorable guy. So that's what's going on. So I don't know if I preempted your question, but there's no question in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, California, going to lose population unless they start recognizing they got to get their expenditures under control. I am a believer in the progressive income tax structure. I believe rich people should pay more in taxes. What we have to do as a nation is coalesce around the question, what should the maximum tax rate be on wealthy people? I called Warren Buffett seven years ago. And I have enormous respect for Warren. I asked him that question. His response then, he may be different now, was if you make a million dollars a year, 35% tax rate. If you make over $5 million a year, 40%. Well, I have no problem with that. I've said publicly, I'm willing to work six months for the government, six months for myself, but we're well past that. And I go nuts when I hear about this expression, whether from Phil Murphy or even Joe Biden, when they talk about fair share. What is fair share? What is fair share? It's nice to talk about what someone else should get of somebody else's work effort. I'm prepared to give 50% of my work effort to the government. I think that's reasonable and it's fair. Beyond that, I think it comes confiscatory. If you ask Bernie Sanders, he'd probably say 90% marginal tax rate. You ask AOC, God knows what she would say, probably say take it all. Elizabeth Warren is 70% plus a wealth tax, which makes no sense. I've written her a five-page letter explaining to her why it makes no sense. And then uh, Paul Krugman writes for Times asking the question, he says 64%. I think that's too high to take away the incentive. And the wealth tax makes no sense. And they have this, such a negative dialogue about wealthy people. And again, I'm not a spokesman for the wealthy. I grew up in the South Bronx, went to PS75 in the South Bronx, Morris High School in the South Bronx, City University of New York in the West Bronx. I'm a son of an immigrant. My father came to America from Poland at the age of 13 as a plumber's apprentice. He died carrying a sink up a four-story tenement from a heart attack. I'm self-made. I'm giving it all away. That's the American dream. Why are they crapping on wealthy people? How do you get wealthy in America? You get wealthy because you develop a product or service that somebody needs. Is the world better off or worse off because of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Larry Ellison, Bernie Marcus, Ken Lango? And I say infinitely, the world's better off. These people made a lot of money. They developed products and services that the world found useful. And they then took this money and they recycled it back into society. There's no reason to criticize them. Raise the tax rate. Don't damn them. Praise them for what they've done. Okay, but don't damn them. Sorry for being in a soapbox, Jonathan. I get what you're saying, and I agree with it. And without them, we're talking to ourselves, though. We're talking to ourselves. Not only would the world not be better off, there'd be a heck of a lot less hospitals, a heck of a lot less museums. And all the people you just mentioned are extremely philanthropic, and they've helped the world in immense ways. I would would say to you, listeners, many years ago, I figured out there's only four things you could do with money when you think about it. What are the four things you could do with money? The first thing you could do is you could pleasure yourself. You could buy a plane. You could buy cars. You could buy homes. You could buy art. If you're an art collector, you never have enough money because you could spend $100 million on one canvas. I don't collect art. And I happen to have a view that material possessions brings with it aggravation. So I'm a less is more kind of guy. I'm married 56 years to the same woman. Uh, she taught as an educator for 30 years. She was very purposeful. We didn't collect things. The second thing you do with money is you give to your children. But if you have a lot of money, giving all your money to your kids is a mistake because you deprive them of self-achievement. So I've given my kids a reasonable sum of money. One made it all on his own. One needed it because he's a scientist, didn't make a lot of money. But I wouldn't give all my money to my kids. It's just damaging. The third thing you do with money is you give it to the government. But only a fool gives the government money you don't have to give. You pay your taxes as a tax-paying citizen, but you don't give them extra. And the fourth thing you do with your money is you recycle back in society. And that's what I've elected to do. You mentioned the giving plate. The fact that in Columbia, the biggest thing I've done is call Koopman College Scholars. I gave $50 million to send 1,000 plus kids in Essex County, New Jersey to college. I pay their tuition. You're changing their lives. The average lifetime earnings of a college graduate is well over a million dollars more than a non-college graduate. Plus you give them tools to be competitive in the world that we're in. I enjoy giving it away. How do you select the scholars? We have a board of around 15 people that interview the kids, and we have requirements. So number one, you have to live in Essex County, New Jersey. Number two, you have to be academically qualified. So we have a board that interviews the kids. I believe in teaching people how to fish, not giving fish. Third, you have to have a financial need unmet by government. 
Fourth, you have to enroll in a free three-week pre-college program designed by Franklin and Marshall, which explains to these young kids what to expect when they're in college, because they need mentoring, they need direction. And we give them up to $10,000 a year, plus other things. And the wonderful thing, which I take zero credit for, the only credit I take is putting the money in to enable it to happen, 35% of Newark High School kids go to college. Historically, only 5% manage to graduate. I have Twinkle Morgan running the program, a lady who's just terrific. And my first cohort just graduated college. We started about five years ago. and We had a 73% graduation rate, which is fabulous. Wow. And do you ever see the kids? Oh, I meet with them every year. This year, I got to do it virtually, but I meet with them every year. I explain that throughout life, they can have setbacks, but what makes for success is how you deal with the setbacks. So this weekend... Warren Buffett released his annual letter, which everyone makes a big deal out of. I don't know if people... They should. The man with a lot of wisdom. He's a very smart guy. Was there anything in the letter that surprised me? Didn't say much of anything about the stock market, though. What I thought was kind of odd, I don't know if you did, was he didn't talk about why he didn't put any meaningful amount of money to work during March and April. you have any idea why he didn't? Yeah, my guess is he thinks the market is reasonably fully valued. He's a very rational guy and very unusual. Not only did he not put a lot of money to work, but he sold his airlines and he very rarely sells in the hold. So he had a pessimistic assessment of the airline business. He sold at the wrong time, but I have enormous respect for him. And I would say that probably having trouble finding cheap stocks, which is why he spent $25 billion buying his own stock back. I think that he would probably acknowledge the stock is undervalued, but I don't think he thinks it's that undervalued. So you don't think, you've always mentioned that Henry Singleton at Teledyne was one of your best investments. You don't think he would do something that he did, just buy back massive quantities of stock? And that really, let me digress for a moment. It just shows you the foolishness of Wall Street. In 1982, Business Week had a picture of Dr. Singleton, the founder of Teledyne, on his cover. And they pictured him as Icarus, the mythical Greek god with the wax wings that flew too close to the sun. The wings melted, he crashed, and he fell to earth. And they were highly critical of his stock repurchase activity. Singleton, with eight self-tender offers, retired 90% of his stock, never selling a share of his own stock. He was born with humble beginnings in Texas, I think to the son of a cotton farmer, got a number one in his class in Naval Academy, PhD in electrical engineering, brilliant, brilliant guy. And he basically bought back, like I said, 90% of his stock before anybody understood stock repurchase. And I'm going to reach into my case here. I have a couple of letters from Warren Buffett on the subject. So um, in 2007, November 23rd, to be precise, I gave a speech to the Value Investing Congress. I gave it on two subjects. One stock repurchase, which I was highly critical of the way it was being done in 2007. Everybody was buying stock back at a high. And Dr. Singleton, where I explained his approach. And Warren wrote me a letter. This is November 23rd of 07. I'll take the liberty of reading it to you. Dear Lee, I don't think you could have picked two better subjects. Henry is a manager that all C- investors, CEOs, would-be CEOs, and MBA students should study. In the end, he was 100% rational. And there are very few CEOs about whom I could make that statement. The stock repurchase situation is fascinating to me. That's because the answer is so simple. You do it when you are buying dollar bills at clear cut and significant discount, and only then. Paragraph, the general observation would say that most companies that repurchased shares 30 years ago, now it's like 45 years ago, were doing it for the right reasons, and most companies doing it now are wrong when doing so. Time after time, I see managers who are attempting to be fashionable or perhaps subconsciously hoping to support their stock. I gave Lowe's, L-O-E-W-S, the uh, conglomerate is a good example of a stock repurchase that did it the right way. Lowe's is a great example of a company that has always repurchased shares for the right reason. I could give examples of the reverse, but I try to follow the dictum. I love this praise by name, criticized by category. Best regards, Warren. <laughs> I would say that relative to other people's stocks, he feels his stock is cheap. But I don't think he feels his stock is like, terribly undervalued. I haven't asked him that. Then I'm looking for the other letter he sent me. I have to do some memory. In 1982, I sent a letter to business. When they had Singleton on the cover, I was saying this guy was great and he said this guy was terrible. So I felt motivated when I was an analyst at Goldman to respond to Business Week. 
So I wrote him a seven page letter telling him how dumb they were and how wrong they were. And Buffett sent me a letter, which, by the way, in 1982, I framed and to this day is hanging on my wall in my office. He wasn't famous in 1982. And I said, that's my biggest mistake. So I thought so well of him that I took his letter, I framed it and hung it on my wall. But I never bought his stock. <laughs> that was a big mistake. And when he said, dear Lee, okay, I always enjoyed both the quality of your writing and the quality of your reading. I used to write a monthly report. Okay, your letter to Business Week read, tell Don was 100% of the mark, best regards, Warren. And he told me offline back in 82, in the bear market, that he tried to buy it and he missed it by about four or five points and it went up around 300 points afterwards. <laughs> I think it was one of a kind. I just want to thank you for your time. You've been more than generous. You've had a wonderful career that I've enjoyed following. Not over really yet. Not over. I'm, I'm a private citizen, but I'm still working. As I said, I didn't have any time to take bridge lessons because I'm busy. I got 40 positions in my portfolio. I talk to companies. I believe in doing research and I study the macro environment. And, you know, I'm a man with an opinion. Could be wrong, but I have an opinion. Well, it's good to have an opinion. And maybe there's a guy in Omaha who plays bridge. Maybe he can teach you. Uh... <laughs> well, he's got an opinion and his opinion is more valuable than my opinion. And I would say, given what he's doing, he doesn't see any great bargains in the market and he's biding his time. I hope you enjoyed the show. To be sure you never miss another World According to Boyer episode, please follow us on Twitter at Boyer Value. Until next time. Mm-hmm.